Well, good morning and welcome to Victory Online from Victory Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We are so glad that you joined us this morning for the broadcast. Now, I want to also announce to you for next week, we are going to be back meeting here in church. So that is going to be, I'm looking so forward to seeing all of your smiling faces. We are going to continue posting the, the sermons online on YouTube and on uh, Facebook. So uh, those of you that have been watching, uh, live in other areas, other cities that have been watching our broadcast, thank you, by the way, for the comments that you've been leaving us and the correspondence that you've had with us. We greatly appreciate that, and we're glad to have the opportunity to be able to share the Word with you. Those of you that are members or attend here at Victory Church, again, we will be, start back with our regular services next Sunday morning, so we're really looking forward to that. Now, I want to, I'm going to continue this morning with where we left off last week on a look in the mirror, and this is going to be part two. Uh, I got a lot of feedback last week from last uh, uh, Sunday's sermon, and I, which I appreciate very much, and I want to go into a little bit more detail on some things. Actually, I guess today I want to go more into the how-to of how to look in the mirror, but for just a moment, we want to review a few things that we went over. I want to kind of set the stage as we move forward this morning. So if you will turn with me in your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to look here at verse 17. Remember, we talked about in two different places, and we're going to look at the second one here in just a moment, about where it talks about a mirror, looking into the mirror. Here in 2 Corinthians three seventeen, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, now that word's very important there, into the same image from, the, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. One of the things that I want you to notice here in particular, as we look into the, to this mirror, the mirror of the Spirit, we are transformed. That word transformed there is the Greek word that we get our word metamorphosis from. It means to be changed. So one of the things that we find that is very interesting about this mirror, uh, actually one moment I want you to turn to James and then I'm going to tell you that. So turn with me to James chapter 1 and we'll, uh, we'll set the stage with what we're talking about here, the particular type of mirror. James 1. In verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. So he's telling you that that mirror that you're looking into is the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And it's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So what, what James is talking about here is that we are supposed to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Another way that we could express that is put action to what it is that we believe. Putting action to what it is that you believe is the mechanism. It's the way that faith operates. Now over in chapter 2, in verse 8, James tells you here, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture you shall love your neighbor as yourself and we looked at that last week when he's talking about looking into this mirror of the law of liberty chapter 2 calls it the royal law the royal law is the love commandment and that is to love God with all your heart heart soul mind and strength love your neighbor as yourself that's what he's talking about so as we look into that mirror as we look into becoming more Christ-like, then what happens is, according to the, uh, the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, according to that particular passage of Scripture, by looking into that, we are changed. Now see, this is a special mirror. Most mirrors that we look into, at least all of them that I'm aware of, when you look into a particular mirror, it reflects back the way that you look currently. And we looked last week at one of the things that you're able to do by looking into a mirror 
is to examine yourself. And that's what we do when we look into a mirror. We look into a mirror, we examine ourselves. Now, this particular mirror that we're talking about today is very special. And that is that as you look into this mirror, it actually changes you. Now, that's, that's really good. As we look into this mirror of the perfect law of liberty, it actually changes us. We go through a transformation, a metamorphosis. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how to do that. What exactly is that talking about? I was talking with my son, Andrew, uh, about this um, early, uh, uh, sometime this week. And one of the things that he pointed out that I thought was very good is if you think about this as a standard. If you look at that mirror as a standard that you are trying to become. Now that standard that you're trying to become, according to James and according to the Apostle Paul, is... Love. We're supposed to grow into that character or that person of love. Now, also, we know that the Word of God is powerful, and the Word of God will change you. So, also, you can take or apply this where the Word is concerned. You can look into what the Word says and use that as your standard, and as you do that, it will change you. It will cause you to begin to line up with what the Word says, because, as you know, the Word doesn't change. It's the same. The Word of God is the same. It is steadfast. It is immutable. And therefore, if we stand on it, if we observe it, if we look at it, if we use that as our standard, we are the ones that change and line up with what the Word says about us. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now first, what I want you to do, and we, have, uh, we actually have little cards like this available in our church. Uh, they're actually in the back, back there right now. That uh, People that attend here, you're welcome to pick these up. They're free. And on this is a confession. Now you know a lot of times when we look at confession and you hear the word confession, we automatically think, well, confession means that, you're, that you, it has to do with sin. That you're, you're expressing. Confession, to confess something just means to give voice to it. Just means to speak. So we have lots of confessions around here. We have lots of verses of Scripture uh, or, 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 or things that we have gotten from Scripture that we put on these that you can carry. I carry this in the front of my Bible. So this is our love confession. Now up on your screen, you're going to see this love confession. And what I want you to do is I want you to read this along with me. Now, what we have done is we have taken 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8a in the Amplified Bible, and then we have personalized those particular passages of Scripture to reflect us. So, as this is up on the screen, I want you to read this particular passage with me. Are you ready? All of us together simultaneously. I endure long and impatient and kind. I am never envious nor boil over with jealousy. I am not boastful or vainglorious. I do not display myself haughtily. I am not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. I am not rude, unmannerly, and I do not act unbecomingly. I, God's love in me, do not insist on my own rights or my own way. For I am not self-seeking, I am not touchy or fretful or resentful. Now we need to go back and go over that one again. Some people need that a little extra of that. Uh, I am not touchy or fretful or resentful. What, 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 one more time. I, I am not touchy or fretful or resentful. I take no account of the evil done to me. I pay no attention to a suffered wrong. I do not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoice when right and truth prevail. I bear up under anything and everything that comes. I am ever ready to believe the best of every person. My hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and I endure everything without weakening. I never fail, never fade out, or become obsolete, or come to an end. Now, isn't that a powerful passage of Scripture? Doesn't that bless you? 
That doesn't that just make you feel good when you read that? That in our Bible tells us what love. This, this is called the love, one of the love chapters in our Bible, First Corinthians chapter thirteen. And what happens is we are supposed to be creatures of love. This is the law that we're supposed to be looking into. This is what we're we are supposed to become. What it was you just read. We are supposed to look at that and become that person. By looking at that and using that as our mirror, it will transform us into that. See, the Bible tells us that God is love. It doesn't say that God possesses love. It says that He is love. The Bible also tells us that we are born of God. So if we are born of God, it would be accurate to say that we are born of love. Well, if we're born of love, then that should be our nature. But what happens is, is the world, uh, the, in the state that it's in, tries to keep that from coming out in us. It tries to keep us to going back to that old carnal nature instead of allowing the love of God to come out in us. Instead of allowing us to reflect the love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts. Well, by doing this, I, I, I virtually do this every day. I, I, I say this particular passage of Scripture, I, I read, I have, like I said, I have the card in my Bible. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have it in several Bibles, different Bibles that I use to study out of. I, I have this particular confession in there because this is who I want to become. This is the person that I want to be. So this is what I set before myself and confess that and look into that and it starts changing the way that I act. It starts changing the way that you look at problems. It starts changing the way that you look at circumstances. It's a wonderful thing. You can do this with the, the, with the Word. Actually, we're going to talk about this later on today. This isn't the only passage of Scripture you can do this. Actually, you can do this with any verse of Scripture in the Bible. And it's a really good thing for us to do that. So... Here we, as we look into this, let, let's take a look maybe at some other verses of Scripture that would help us. Let's look at some other verses of Scripture that we can hold as our standard and look upon those verses of Scripture, and those verses of Scripture will transform us into what that particular passage is saying. So one of those that I want you to look at is over in Ephesians chapter 2, so Turn there with me, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, you're going to like this one. Have any of you out there ever felt like you were in the mully grubs? You know what I'm talking about when I say the mully grubs, don't you? You just feel down and kind of low and like everything's caving in on you? Well, you know, there's a whole lot of verses of Scripture in the Bible that'll lift you up out of that. Here in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 1. This, this may be a passage of Scripture here that you want to look at and allow it to transform you. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. And you He made alive, who were dead in, transpa- in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, see I like that, it's past tense, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of, of the air. I want you to notice that the apostle Paul, who the apostle Paul says here, he also says it over 1 Corinthians 4 4, but who he talks about is in charge. This world system, this fallen state of the world system, there is somebody ruling over that. Actually, that person, or that, that, that being, is a fallen renegade spirit, a fallen archangel named uh, Lucifer. We call him Satan. Uh, you, we all used to walk according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also once conducted us. We used to also act this way. We conducted ourselves in all the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But, God, I love it. You know, it is really interesting to go through your Bible. I, I call them the but God scriptures. You find all kinds of things in the Bible that will talk about this, and this is usually the way that it does it. It will talk about bad things and things that are happening to you or things that are happening to a particular group of people. And then it says, but God. Now, one of the ways I like to think of this is uh, when you see the word but, that means draw a line. 
That means you have something on this side, but, and now you have something on this side. Uh, my truck is in the parking lot, but I'm inside. So draw a line. So here he's talked about being influenced, being ruled by the prince, the power of the air, by wickedness in the earth that causes, uh, uh, he refers to them as the children of wrath. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, thank God for His mercy, because of His great, what? Love. Isn't that what we're talking about this morning? Because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved. And now then look at this. This is what I was talking about. Are, have, you, have there been times in your life you've been feeling low? Uh, you've been feeling down, you've been feeling oppressed, depressed, suppressed, oppressed, whatever, all those pressed words. And He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, one of the things I like about this next verse, verse 7, this kind of lets you know what's going to happen when we're in heaven. Some people have a picture of heaven as us sitting around on clouds dropping water balloons down on people. Or playing a harp or something like that. Can I share something with you? And I'm not preaching on this this morning. This is my first sidetrack for those of y'all that are, that are keeping score out there. Uh, there are people that believe that when you go to heaven, you become an angel. You don't become an angel. You're in a different class of being than an angel. Actually, you are in a higher class of being than an angel is. You, we're the ones that are created in God's image. Angels are not created in God's image. You would be stepping down to become an angel. But they think that we're going to go to heaven and just kind of fly around and wear white robes. Now we are going to have robes. And you are going to be able to travel at very fast speeds. I personally believe speed of light. But I want you to notice here that we just kind of think that we're going to just go around and you know just walk around and enjoy the streets of gold, which that is going to be wonderful. And uh, we're, we're going to have, and it's going to be a wonderful place. But we're going to be there a long time. So what are we going to do during this time? Verse seven gives us a hint, gives us a little bit of insight that in the ages plural to come. So is that talking about this age? We call this age the dispensation of grace or the church age or uh, that, that we're in right now. Uh, so there are going to be apparently ages, more than one, to come. So according to this verse of Scripture, we, know, we already know in our Bible there's, there's at least one more age that comes after this, and that's the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. But this word is plural, so apparently there are more ages even after that. So it gives us a little clue, a little insight here as to what we may be doing during that period of time. That in the ages to come... He might show the exceeding richness of His grace in His kindness towards us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we all are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. One of the things that the Bible tells us in another particular passage is that He is going to show us His handiwork. So in the ages to come, God is going to show us we're going to go on field trips. And God is going to show us different places of the... Now I'm talking ages, you know, like way on down the road. We're, we're going to be going and looking at, at, at different places in the universe, different things. As a matter of fact, I believe that, he's, that, that there are places out there that, that the Lord had you in mind when He made it. And he's going to take it, he's going to show you, he said, you know, I was thinking of you when I made this, because I know how much you like this. And I've got these three stars right here, and every 739 years, they all come together right here. And I have this planet right here that's made out of diamonds. And when all those, it lights up this whole quadrant of the universe. When we, and and, and I, I, thought, I thought about you when I made that, and I want you to see that. I have been looking forward to showing that. See, there may be things like that that we have down the road. Now, that's, that's, that's really good. That's something exciting to think about. But we find in this particular passage of Scripture what I want to focus back in on. I've gotten off a track here just a little bit. The thing that I want to focus on is 
He has raised us up together, verse 6, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, we were dead in our trespasses. We walked according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the God of this world. But when we were born again, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God raised us up out of that. And I want you to notice, the way that God looks at you, have y'all learned yet that it's real important to look at you the way that God looks at you? That's the perspective that you're supposed to have. That's the reflection we are trying to attain. We are trying to achieve. We are trying to get to a point to where we see ourselves the way that God sees us. And the way that God sees you is lifted up and seated in heavenly places. Now, as a matter of fact, seated in heavenly places with Christ. Huh. Now, where is Jesus right now? Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us, waiting for His enemies to be made His footstool. God sees you. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we are joint heirs. Joint heir means you share equally in an inheritance. So the things that the Father has given to the Son, the Lord Jesus, we share that inheritance with Him. And God already looks at it as if it were done. He already looks at you as seated together in heavenly places. Now, one of the things that is significant about that is this. Don't you think that your problems would look a little different to you if you were looking at them from the perspective of heaven? Don't you think that things, the circumstances in your life that are trying to drag you down, that are trying to come against you, don't you think that those things would look a little different to you if you looked at yourself as a position of raised up above them, looking down upon them. All, you know, if you're looking down on them from heaven, from a heavenly position, they all of a sudden don't look so big, do they? You know, things in life have a whole lot to do with your perspective. And when you develop, like we talked about last week, You've got to be careful that you don't develop a grasshopper mentality. That you don't develop an attitude that your problems are so large, so great, that they're overpowering you. That's that's you seeing yourself according to your own ability. But my brother and sister, that's not the way that things are. The way that things are according to God is we have been raised up together in heavenly places In Christ Jesus. We are far above our power. But now listen. Just because you have that position. Doesn't mean you automatically walk in victory. Remember. You still have to operate. The kingdom of God operates according to a substance. And that substance is faith. And that faith operates in an atmosphere of love. So you've got to walk in love. And become the person that we just talked about earlier. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you also have to apply or operate in faith. Remember the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Remember the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. So we have to learn to walk in love and to apply faith. And when you do those things, you're in a position of being above your problems. You'll have the victory. Do you understand you've already had the victory when the Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus? What a person that has the position of more than a conqueror means, we didn't have to fight the battle, but yet we get to share in the benefits. We get to share in the spoils of that victory, which Jesus defeated the enemy. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. We share in that with Him. But it doesn't just come automatically. Remember the Bible also tells us, you have not because you ask not. We are still operating with God according to a legal contract or a covenant. And that covenant operates by us expressing our desires and our needs to our covenant partner according to the contract. 
And when you do that, then it's provided back to us. Remember, we, we've talked about that earlier. That's how faith operates. So, some other things that uh, uh, would be good for you to know. Some other verses of Scripture that it would be good for you to look at. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Man, Romans chapter 8 is full of all kinds of good things. It's a powerful, powerful chapter. Uh, we know that uh, over here in uh, uh, Romans, this is, this is where this starts out, where there's therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. That's the way that the chapter starts out. And then uh, we can get, we get over into verse 31. It, it, verse 31 is a good verse of Scripture. No, what can we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I like, I like to say it this way. If God is for us, what difference does it make who's against us? If God is on your side, it don't matter who's against you. He who did not spare His own Son, who delivered Him for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Listen, we fly over this verse of Scripture a lot of times because we're trying to get to other passages. Verse 32 in Romans chapter 8 is a powerful, powerful verse of Scripture. And what this verse of Scripture says, there's something you need to be aware of. If God did not spare Jesus, talking about from the cross, then why would He withhold anything from you? In other words, if there was something that God was going to go back on, or if there was something that God was not going to follow through with, it would have been that He would have withheld the death of His Son. He would not have allowed His Son to be killed. He would have withheld that, but He didn't. Now, now listen, if He didn't withhold that from you, then He is not going to withhold anything from you. Anything that is in that covenant. Do you know healing is in that covenant? Do you know that financial blessing is in that covenant? Do you know that peace is in that covenant? Do you know that vision and direction is in that covenant? All of those things have been provided for us. God is not withholding them. But you have to operate in the kingdom of God the way that He has set it up to operate. So this is a powerful verse, verse of Scripture. Verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The, the Bible the answers no, nobody. It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God and also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long and are counted as sheep for the sword. Yet in all of these things, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means nothing can separate you from the love of God. The, inside the love of God, that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about looking into this. Can I share? I've got good news for you this morning. Do you know that God doesn't have a mad where you're concerned? Do you know God doesn't get mad at you? How many of you believe that God walks in love? I mean, if He tells us to do it, do you think He does it? Do, do you think God walks in love such that He doesn't take an account of a suffered wrong? You know, I tell my grandchildren, there, you know, there are some times with my grandchildren that uh, I may come across with a stern voice. Oftentimes that comes across when I have instructed them to do something and they didn't do it the way that I told them to do it. And so what happens is, is I, will, I am instructing them in a particular way that I want something done. And when I get through with that conversation, I always ask them this question. I ask them, do you think Papa's mad at you? And they always say no. They, their answer is always, no, Papa, you're not mad at us. How do you know I'm not mad at you? And they always say back to me, Papa, you don't have any mad towards us. You never get mad towards us. That's right. I don't ever get mad at them. 
Why? Because I walk in love towards them. I love them. And it's, it, it's that love that compels me to instruct them, to encourage them, to provide tidbits of, my, of, of, of vast Papa knowledge and wisdom. But I don't get mad. And what I have to watch sometimes is, is you forget when you're talking to a child how you can come across. So I always make sure at the end of that, end of that conversation that they, I, I've got the, the younger grandsons that I have. I, I, when I'm around, I say, do you know your papa loves you? Yes, papa. How do you know that your papa loves you? Because you tell us all the time. Well, that's what I want them to think. That's what I, I want them to know that no matter what, nothing can happen that can cause me to not walk in love towards them. Now, what I'm doing, I mean, aside from just the fact that that's the way papas are supposed to be, but aside from that, I am trying to demonstrate to them the way that their heavenly father treats them, the way that their heavenly father is towards them. I'm trying to be the representative in their life that shows them the love of God. Now, that's a real important position. Papas have real important positions in their grandchildren's lives. So in all, nothing can separate us from the love of God. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him. Now, one of the things that I want you to look at this morning with me is I want you to look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And verse 17 is where we're going to start here. Now this, if you can develop some understanding where this is concerned, it will really help you. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now this word new creation literally means a new class of being. Something that hasn't existed before. See, I think sometimes we don't fully understand, and, and I, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to fully understand, but we ought to have, you know, some understanding of what happens at the new birth. One of the things that happens at, at the new birth is this. You are, when you are born again, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your spirit man, remember your three-part being, spirit, soul, and body? Your spirit man, which was separated from God, spiritually dead. Remember, spiritually death does not mean cease to exist. Spiritual death means separation from God. So your spirit man, we just read here, the Apostle Paul was telling us that we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Your spirit man was separated from God. When you are born again, God makes alive your spirit unto Him. You are born again, born of His Spirit. You are spiritually alive, through the, and it's the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Spirit that causes that to happen in each of us. Well, when that happens, it is such a change, it is such a transformation, it is such a metamorphosis, that it's literally as, you, as if you have become a different class of being. Now see, the thing with us is we, we are trained, you know, I mean, we look on the outside, the outward appearances of people. When somebody is born again, they still look the same way that they did before that occurred. But remember the reason that we do that is because we're looking at their earth suit. That's what your body is. Your body is your earth suit. It's the... It's the suit that allows you to live and operate and function on this planet. Now, you understand that when you go to heaven, this, change, this suit changes. Doesn't the Apostle Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians that it changes in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this body, which is corruptible, will put off corruption and take on incorruption? It's your, it's our body changes. Jesus' body changed. He had a, we call it a glorified body. That's what happens to each one of us, either at the rapture or either after we die and then 
then uh, uh, go to heaven. You, ha- you have to have a particular type of body to live in heaven. It, and it's a different body than the one that's here on the earth. Now, you'll look the same. You'll be able to recognize it, But it's made up, the composition of it is a little bit different. I don't have time to go into that in detail. But I actually covered this a whole lot in another series that I did. But I'm, I'm not going to that this morning. I, I avoided that distraction as it went by just then. So, you're a new creature. You're a new class of being when you are born again. Now, that's really good to know. So, this tells us a little bit about how powerful this is. Now, old thing, or, or now all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God in Christ was reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespass to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21. I'm going to close with this today. For He, that's talking about God, has made Him, talking about Jesus, who knew no sin to be or to become sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now, I want you to look and pay close attention to this particular verse of Scripture. Because this verse, if you get an understanding of this verse of Scripture, it will change the way that you think. I do not like songs or hymns. You, you do understand that a lot of times what happens is a lot of the church world, our Bible doctrine is based on hymns. Well, there are some hymns that are really good. There are some hymns that are not. Hymns that talk about us being worthless and unworthy worms, all kinds of stuff like that. I don't want to listen to things that refer to me in my old nature. Those things I just read right there, they've passed away. All things have become new, started over, clean slate. You at one time were unworthy. But listen, God loved you so... God knew you were a stinker. And, and, he, and He paid the price for you anyway. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a powerful thing happens. And this particular passage of Scripture here is trying to describe to you the change, the transformation that occurs. And He says, this is what happened. God the Father made Jesus become sin, although He knew no sin. And He did that for a reason. And that reason was so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, this is what I want to get to this morning. We're going to pick this up next week also. There will be a part three to this. But where I want to get to this morning is this. Because you were born again, because of the redemptive work that the Lord Jesus did, because He shed His blood for us, to deliver us from our sin, we have become a new creature and we have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, there are people that misunderstand. And here again, they're not looking in the mirror correctly. And they they look at something in, in in Romans chapter 1 that is not written to them, about them. It's written about the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember over there where it says, there is none righteous, no, not one? Our righteousness is as a filthy rags. Well, our righteousness before we accept Jesus is as filthy rags. But I have good news for you. Your righteousness is not based on you. Your righteousness is based on the redemptive act, the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus. And you have made, been made to become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus with all rights and privileges of a men- member of the kingdom of heaven. Now that's a good place to be. That sounds like somebody that's seated together in heavenly places. That's somebody that sounds like somebody that's above their problems. You are not righteous because of something you did. 
You are not righteous because of something that you achieve, because you can't do that. You can't make yourself righteous. But by accepting the Lord Jesus, God Himself, by that act, He recognizes what Jesus did, and because of that act, and our accepting that, we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, the reason that is significant to you is this. There are a lot of people, because they believe that they are not the righteousness of God, they skip over the verses of Scripture in the Bible that talk about righteousness. They think, well, that's not talking to me because I'm not the righteous. My righteousness is filthy rag. There's none righteous. No, not none. Uh, no, not one. The righteous verses of Scripture in the Bible are talking about you. The righteous verses of Scripture are talking about you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if there is one thing that I want you to understand when you look in the mirror of love and the mirror of the Word, I want you to start understanding and start seeing yourself as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, I hope you've learned something today. I have sure enjoyed sharing this with you. I really enjoyed this, and I remember we're going to be together next week, and that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, at this time, we'd like to receive our morning tithes and offerings. If you'd like to go ahead and get your offering out, we're going to pray for it here in just a moment. We're going to say our confession, so I'd like for you to get your offering in your hand, and I want you to repeat after me. We're going to have the offering confession here up on the screen, and I want you to repeat with me, all of us together, simultaneously. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs then I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My desire for you is that God's richest and best be yours. And I want you to remember, there is victory in Jesus.